to you in peace. Amen. We're on week four of, of this sermon series looking at Old Testament heroes um, that had major detours or distractions or mistakes in their lives and God took them where they were and turned them around and used them to change the world around them. It's, it's been very interesting for me to look at these biblical heroes in this way these last weeks to kind of see the larger picture of their lives and the context and the background for their calling. And with Rahab today, um, fascinating story, and I wish we had 45 minutes to kind of go through it. Unfortunately, we don't, um, but we'll be talking about Rahab a little bit more in the adult forum. This incredibly fascinating story and an intricacies and twists and turns and seeing how Rahab, how God used Rahab, where she was, turned her around, uh, oriented her toward God, and there was an amazing outcome. Now, to understand Rahab, today's sermon is really a Bible story, telling the Bible story of Rahab. To understand Rahab the harlot and what she did in the walls of Jericho before they came a-tumbling down when Joshua marched around it, it's important to know a little bit of history or background to get to the point of understanding what Rahab was doing and the important role she played in God's history of salvation um, in the story of Joshua. Um, recognize that Joshua was the city that the people of Israel had to conquer if they were going to inhabit the Promised Land. So in order to get to the Promised Land after their wilderness wanderings, they had to conquer Jericho. And conquering Jericho comes in the book of Joshua. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Kings, you know, all that. So Joshua is the sixth book of the Bible. And what leads up to where they are in the book of Joshua is an important event in the book of Numbers, which is kind of a chronology kind of book. Um, Moses led the people out of Israel in Exodus. They're wandering in the wilderness for all of those years um, after being in captivity in Egypt. And they're working toward the time that they'll occupy the promised land in Joshua, um, the book of Joshua, the sixth book of the Bible. So in the book of Numbers, when they're wandering, the people of Israel had seen and experienced all kinds of mighty acts of God. They'd seen the Red Sea, the water coming out of the rock, the manna and the quail from heaven, God leading them with a pillar of cloud and night and day. They had experienced the presence of God and knew that God wanted something greater for them. Like I said last week, God's will is to abundantly bless those who follow him. So they knew that that was lying ahead of them, but they had no uh, idea at this time that it was going to be 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. They, they thought they were just going to make it into the promised land. They came to the edge of the promised land in Numbers chapter 13. And they were encamped just south of the promised land of Canaan. And the Lord asked Moses, Moses, why don't you just send some spies into the land to see how good it is? Remember that. So um, from the 12 tribes of Israel that we talked about last week, Moses chose one leader from each of the 12 tribes of Israel to be a spy, a leader of their tribe, to go in and bring back a report on what the promised land would be. Moses also, a couple of times in those verses, said, okay, dudes, you go out and be bold. He says the word, be bold, several times, and bring back some fruit of the land. When they came into the promise, when those spies went into the promised land, they spied out the land for 40 days. They spied out the land for 40 days, and when they came back, they liked what they saw in the promised land that would, would be filled with uh, milk and honey and all kinds of things that were promised to be good. And even Moses asked, bring back some fruit. Go to the fruit stand uh, Saturday market and bring back some fruit of the promised land. And in Numbers it says, they cut down from there a branch of a single cluster of grapes and they carried it on a pole between them, a cluster of grapes that was so huge in the promised land that they needed a pole to be brought to carry this cluster of massive grapes from the fruit of the promised land. Think of that. I mean, a cluster of grapes so blessed from the promised land. 
hung on a pole so that two men had to carry them. Um, that was God's promised land for them. The 12 spies brought back that kind of report of what the promised land was like. But then the spies also said um, in Numbers, at the end of 40 days, they returned from the spying out of the land. They came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the Israelites in the wilderness. They brought back word to them and all the congregation showed them the fruit of the land. And they told them, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. And then they said, but. <laughs> Remember how the word but negates what went before? They said, but the people who live in the land are strong, and their towns are fortified. And besides, we saw the descendants of the giants there. But Caleb, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Caleb says, let's go and occupy it, for we're well to overcome it. Then the ten who had gone up with him said, wine. They said, we're not able to go up against this people, for they're stronger than we. So they brought out the Israelites. They brought to the Israelites these ten spies an unfavorable report of the land, that it's a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people, they said, are of great size. They're like Goliath, and we're like David. And then they say these words, And to ourselves we seemed like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. These ten spies who went into the land that God said, this is your land. They came back from seeing that land and they said, and to ourselves we seem like grasshoppers and so we seem to them. God said, this is your land. This is a land that's written on your birthright and this is the one that I wish to give you. But the ten spies who came back with the negative report had a grasshopper complex. To ourselves, we seemed like grasshoppers, and so we seemed to them. They didn't focus on the problems. They didn't focus on the promise that God had given them. They focused on problems of their own creating. They focused on their issues rather than God's potential. They didn't, they didn't say, this is our land to occupy because God has said this is ours, and God wishes to abundantly bless those who follow him. Instead, they focused on the giants instead of on God. They sent back the message that we can't do it. Not only, Moses, is it a problem that's too big for you, it's too big for God. Okay, that's happened in Numbers 13. Sometimes I think the grasshopper complex is when we know that God is calling us to do something. As God is calling us to live into the purpose God looks has for our lives, we look at ourselves and we think we're grasshoppers. We're not up to the task. We look at the challenge, the great thing that God has called us to do, and we turn away. We focus on our little grasshopper problems rather than on God's promise of the promised land. Well, what happened is that based on the report of those 10 spies who looked in the promised land for 40 days, God got so mad at them and gave them 40 years in the wilderness. The 40 years comes from the 40 days that the 10 spies were in the promised land and came back with a negative report. That's one of the tough messages of the Bible, that there are consequences when you don't follow the blessings that God wishes to give you. That's the message of those 40 years. And during those 40 years, every, think of this, during those 40 years wandering in the wilderness, every person who crossed in the Red Sea that Moses delivered, every person died except for Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that God let live from the captivity in Egypt to living in the Promised Land. And that brings us to Joshua. Joshua and Caleb, the only ones who lived because of the bad report of the spies, which God gave them 40 years for each of the days that they spent spying out. Joshua 2.1, <laughs> which Paul read a moment ago. Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim, 
and said, go over to the land, especially Jericho, and they entered the house of a harlot named Rabbit, Rabbi, Rab, Rahab and stayed there. Joshua sent two men on this reconnaissance mission. They were to spy out the land and report to him. Why did Joshua send out two men? Because those were the two ones that came back with the positive report. So Joshua sends two men, and, um, and that was 40 years before when they went in. It was kind of common for travelers to stay at a lodge. That's where Rahab lived and worked, kind of like an ancient boarding house. And continuing our first lesson, we read the king of Jericho was told, look, some of these Israelites have come to spy out the land. So the kings of Jericho sent this message to Rahab, bring out the men who came to you and entered your house because they came to spy out the whole land. Apparently Jericho had its own secret surveillance system. They had drones back in those days, you know, kind of checking out these spies who were going into those places. And the king went out to say, bring back a report from these spies and turn them over to us. What happens next is fascinating. Rahab said to the king's men, yes, the men came to me, but did not, I did not know where they had come from at dusk. <clears throat> when it was time to close the city gate, the men left. She says, I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up to them. The truth was that she had taken these two spies and put them up in the roof and hidden them under stacks of flak <clears throat> that she had hidden on the roof. Mm. I just got a tickle in my throat, excuse me. The truth is she had hid them, so the king's men went out into the city, went all around, went outside of the city gate, looking for these two men that she had hidden on the roof. Fascinating story. Because Rahab knew of God's deliverance. Rahab was a foreigner, she was an outsider, but she was a person of faith in the God of Israel. Notice what she says. She says, we knew about the mighty deeds that God did. She had faith in God. She trusted in God. Even though she was a foreigner, she trusted in the God of Israel. Living in a foreign, unbelieving, pagan city, she believed in the promises of God. So she declares her faith to God in the middle of the first lesson, which reads, before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, and then she makes this statement of faith. I know that the Lord has given this land to you in a time that has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and how you went to Sidon and Og, the two kings of Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When our hearts heard it, we melted. Everyone's courage failed because for of you, the Lord your God is God in heaven above and the earth below. Rahab, an un, from a pagan, unbelieving city, declares her faith in the gods of Israel. And then she demonstrates her faith by hiding the spies in her home. Because of that, her family was spared. Remember last week, God wishes to abundantly bless those who follow him and Rahab was following God. Now a couple chapters later in Joshua chapter 6, after Rahab helped the spies escape, she placed a red cord down her window as the spies instructed her that we'll sing about in just a moment. The army of Israel returned and encircled the city of Jericho, walked around it 13 times in the seventh day, and the last time they circled around it, they blew the trumpet and the walls came a-tumbling down. You know the song. The city was conquered and burned to the ground, and the people of Israel finally inhabited the Promised Land. In Joshua 6.25, we read that Joshua spared Rahab with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men that Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. And here's what's fascinating. Rahab lived with the people of Israel for the rest of her life. Not only that, she also married an Israelite, and Rahab became an ancestor of Jesus Christ. That's where our gospel reading with Rahab is mentioned. 
Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth. Obed the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David the king. Rahab was King David's great, great grandmother. This pagan, unbelieving city produced this woman of faith, Rahab, who became the great, great grandmother of King David. I find that fascinating because part of the reason I do is that I think that I fear that far too many Christians today think that they can't be used by God. Think that they might not be talented enough or smart enough or spiritual enough or even worse, that they've messed up too much or wandered too far away. The story of Rahab tells us something different. The story of Rahab is proof that God can use a harlot like Rahab. And if God can use Rahab, God can use you. Turn your life, open your heart to God is what Rahab did, and God can change your life. God wants you to be willing to be used by God, to see God's purpose in your life. So you might very well just be a Moses or a Jonah or a Jacob or a Rahab, like we've talked about these last weeks, with all kinds of things in your past like they did. But you're not a grasshopper. You're not a grasshopper. Focus on God's call, God's purpose, God's promise, because they did. And God wants to bring out in you, out of the wandering in the wilderness, into a relationship with Him. So as we begin these first months of 2014, focus not on your failures, which may be many. Instead, focus on growing and strengthening and deepening your faith in God. Because, dear friends, that will lead to a faithful and fruitful 2014. Just make a resolution this year to draw near to God, and you will be blessed. You will be encouraged in more ways that you, than you can imagine. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand and sing.